Welcome to the Everything History Podcast for episode 49, De Cesaribus, part 3, by Sextus Aurelius Victor. As I said last time, please note that I myself, Thomas, the narrator, interrupt at no point. So when the first person is used, that is Victor speaking, not me. Also to be mindful of, this book is not without flaws. There are many inaccuracies and prejudices that are written as facts by Victor. They are not. Much of the information contained within De Cesaribus is flat out wrong, but most of it is correct. This is especially true for the Caesars, or emperors as we call them, that the senatorial and equestrian classes despised. Victor also occasionally speaks in a manner that contemporary individuals might find insensitive. I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. This is Everything History. Everything you hold worthwhile is insane. We meant more to kids than Jesus did, or religion at that time. I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Section 18. He had matched the curii and fabricii with his comprehensive learning, really old-fashioned morality and extreme frugality. The soldiers, to whom nothing seemed sufficient, even though the world was already exhausted and ruined, cruelly murdered him at the instigation of Didius on the 80th year of his reign. Section 19. But meanwhile, Didius Julianus, relying on the Praetorians, whose alliance he had secured with even more extravagant promises, advanced from prefect of the watch to the badge of sovereignty. His family was very noble, and he was distinguished for his knowledge of Roman law. In fact, he was the first to codify the edict which used to be published by the praetors in varying and confusing ways. Hence it is generally accepted that unless character helps to restrain our passions, learning is a feeble thing, since even this really strict professor of more righteous conduct proceeded to commit the crime which he had decreed punishable by a new penalty. Not for long, however, did he keep what he had coveted. For, as soon as it was learned what had happened, Septimius Severus, who happened to be waging war in distant lands as governor of Syria, was proclaimed emperor and defeated him in battle near the Milvian Bridge. Men sent to pursue him as he fled cut him down in the palace at Rome. Section 20. Therefore Septimius Severus, moved by grief and anger at the death of Pertinax, and at the same time, because of his hatred of their crimes, immediately cashiered the Praetorian cohorts and, after executing all of his opponents, enrolled Pertinax among the pantheon of gods through a senatorial decree. He ordered the name of Julianus and his writings and achievements erased, but this was the one thing he could not accomplish. So great is the prestige of learned arts that not even a violent disposition can harm the reputation of writers. Moreover, a death of this kind glorifies them, but makes the agent of the deed detestable, since all men, and especially later generations, consider that those talented individuals could not have been suppressed except through public villainy and madness. All good men must put their faith in this, and I especially, for I was born in the country of a poor and uneducated father, yet I have achieved upper-class status in these times through such important studies. This, in my opinion, is really characteristic of our race, which by some quirk of fate, is sparingly productive of good men, yet those whom it has raised it extols, each according to his own merits. Like Severus himself, no one in the state has been more distinguished than he. Although he died at an advanced age, they solemnly decreed that he should be mourned with a public holiday and funeral speech while declaring that it was totally inappropriate for that just man to be born or to die. Clearly this was because they considered him excessive in reforming morality, but after they had attained the level of integrity of their ancestors, just as if they had come to their senses, they considered him compassionate. Thus honesty, which at first is deemed troublesome, when it has been achieved, becomes a source of pleasure and extravagance. Severus defeated Piscinius Niger at Cyzicus, Clodius Albinus at Lyons, and had them killed. Of these, the former, who held Egypt as military governor, had started a war in the hope of gaining supreme power. The latter, who had brought about the assassination of Pertinax, had seized power in Gaul while he was attempting, through fear of his actions, to cross over to Britain, the province which he had been appointed by Commodus. 
Because of the indiscriminate murder of many, he was considered too cruel and given the surname Pertinax, although many think that he had rather adopted the name himself on account of their similar parsimonious lifestyles. I am inclined to believe that it was imposed on him because of his harshness, for when one of his enemies, who had gone over to Albinus because of geographical necessity, as is often the case in civil wars, had nevertheless finally concluded his explanation of reasons by saying, What, I ask, would you have done if you had been in my place? And he replied, I would have endured what you will. Nothing is harsher than this saying, and action sends good and honorable men blame fortune for dissensions of this kind however eagerly they have been undertaken, and would rather allow the truth to be distorted to protect citizens than to ruin them. But he in particular wanted to destroy opposition groups so that he might then behave in a gentler fashion, and preferred to punish an act of necessity so that the expectation of pardon might not gradually lead to the collapse of the state through conspiracies, to which he realized minds were inclined because of the fault of the times. Nor do I myself deny that those types of crime, which have begun to increase excessively, must be eradicated in an almost more than severe manner. He was so successful and skillful, especially in military affairs, that he left no battle except as victor, and he extended the empire by overcoming the king of the Persians named Abgarus. Similarly, he subdued and reduced to provincial status the Arabs, as soon as he attacked them. Severus would also have consigned Ariabene to tribunary status if he had not despised the barrenness of their territory. On account of these great successes, the senators granted him titles Arabicus, Ariabenicus, and Pothicus. He undertook enterprises more serious than these, for he defeated the enemy and then protected Britain, up to the point where the country was useful, with a wall which he built across the island right up to the ocean at both ends. Furthermore, he drove the warlike tribes far away from Tripoli, where his birthplace, Leptis, was situated. These tasks, difficult to achieve, he would accomplish all the more readily, inasmuch as he was implacable with those who failed, but would promote and reward all men of action. Finally, not even petty thefts were allowed to go unpunished, and he was even more careful with his associates because, as a man of experience, he understood that such things were done through the fault of those in command or through factions. He was devoted to philosophy, to oratory, and, in short, to the study of the liberal arts. Similarly, he wrote an autobiography, which was as impressive as it was honest. He established extremely impartial laws. The scandalous behavior of his wife diminished the outstanding reputation of this man, who was so great at home and abroad, for he was so infamously attached to her that he retained her even after he had learned of her wantonness, and when she was implicated in the conspiracy. This is shameful both to a humble man and to the powerful but especially to him, since not only were private citizens, individual soldiers, and criminals under his control, but also magistrates, armies, and even vices themselves. For when he delayed a campaign because of his gout, and the soldiers felt anxious about it, and elected as Augustus his son Bassianus, who was with him as Caesar, he gave orders that he should be carried to the tribunal, and that all who had been responsible for this affair should attend, both the generals, the tribunes, the centurions, and the cohorts, and appear as criminal defendants, when the army, which had been victorious over such great foes, was prostrate on the ground in fear at this, and begged his forgiveness, tapping his head with his hand, he said, Don't you realize that it is the head rather than the feet that rules? Not long afterwards he died of illness in the British town called York, in the eighteenth year of his reign. Born of a fairly humble family, he was educated first in literature, then in law. Dissatisfied with this, as is common for people in limited circumstances, while he was trying various jobs and looking for something better, he climbed to the imperial power. After experiencing graver problems in that position, hard work, cares, fear, and in short, all kind of uncertainties. As if he were a witness of the human condition, he said, I have been everything. I have achieved nothing. His body, which his sons Gaeta and Bastianus had brought to Rome, was honored in splendid fashion and buried in the tomb of Marcus, whom he had so admired that for his sake, he had persuaded the Senate to enroll Commodus among the gods and called him his brother and added the name Antoninus to Bassianus, his son, because it was through the former that he, after many doubtful occurrences, had received the auspicious beginnings of his career through his appointment as advocate of the privy of purse. Naturally, those who worked their way up remember the beginnings of their success and the people responsible. But his heirs, as if they had received orders to make war on one another, immediately parted company 
Accordingly, Yeta, whose name came from his paternal grandfather, since his brother was affronted by his gentler nature, was attacked and perished. This victory was made more shameful by the murder of Papinian, at least in the opinion of devoted historians, since they state that he was in charge of Bastianus's secretariats at that time and was advised, as is the custom, to compose a report for the Roman people as quickly as possible. But he, in his grief for Geta, had said that parricide was not at all as easy to conceal as it was to commit, and therefore he was put to death. But these statements are outrageously absurd, since it is generally accepted that he held the Praetorian Prefecture, and could not have rudely heaped such great abuse on the very man he loved and served as Minister of State. Section 21 on the other hand, Antoninus Bastianus, known to some as Caracalla, won over the Roman populace with unheard of gifts, since he distributed cloaks which reached the ankles, for which he was called Caracalla. Although in a similar manner he gave the garments the name Antoninians after his own name. He crushed the Alemanni, a populous nation who fought wonderfully well from horseback near the river Maine. He was patient, accessible, and calm, and had the same fortune and wife as his father. For, captivated by her beauty, he made every effort to marry his stepmother, Julia, whose crimes I have recorded above since she, in her great eagerness for power, had showed herself unclothed to the gaze of young men as if unaware of his presence. When he passionately declared, I should like, if I may, to, she replied even more shamelessly, for she had stripped off her modesty with her clothes. You want to? Certainly you may. The cults of Egypt were brought to Rome by him, and the city was endowed with the magnificent addition of a new road and the construction of a public bath with beautiful fittings. After these had been completed, and while he was traveling through Syria, he died at Edessa in the sixth year of his reign. His remains were brought back to Rome amid public grief and were buried alongside those of the Antonines. Section 22. Afterwards, Opilius Macrinus who held the Praetorian Prefecture, was declared emperor by the legions, and his son, Diodumenus, was named Caesar. Because of the great grief for the emperor they had lost, the soldiers called the young man Antoninus. However, we have discovered nothing about them, except that they had cruel and ungracious dispositions. For this reason, when they had with difficulty maintained power for barely fourteen months, they were killed by those who had appointed them. Section 23 then Marcus Antoninus, son of Bastianus, was summoned. After his father's death, fearing treachery, he had fled for asylum, so to speak, into the priesthood of the sun god, which the Syrians called Heliogabalus. And for this reason he was called Heliogabalus. He transported a statue of the god to Rome and set up an altar in the innermost parts of the palace. Not even shameless and wanton women were more depraved than he. In fact, he searched the whole world for the lewdest man so that he might watch them or participate in their practice of filthy obscenities. Since these were multiplying day by day, and love for Alexander, whom the nobility had proclaimed Caesar after learning of Upilius' death, was increasing more and more, he, Heliogablus, was overthrown in the Praetorian camp in the thirtieth month of his reign. Section 24. Straight away the power of Augustus was conferred upon Aurelius Alexander, who was born in Syria in the town of Caesarea. With the support also of the soldiers, he, although a young man, nevertheless possessed an intellect beyond his age, and he immediately made large-scale preparations and commenced a war against Xerxes, king of the Persians. After the latter had been defeated and put to flight, Alexander very quickly marched into Gaul, which was being harassed by the plundering raids of the Germans. There he suppressed mutinies in most of the legions with the utmost resolution, which brought him renown for the moment, but subsequently proved fatal, for the soldiers were horrified at the violence of his great severity, from which he had even earned the surname Severus, and they cut him down in a British village named Sicilia, where he happened to be operating with a small retinue. He built for the city a most magnificent monument in his honor, and he was more than dutiful in reverence for his mother, whose name was Mimei. Furthermore, he showed how devoted he was to the nobility and the pursuit of justice by retaining in the same office Domitius Ulpianus, whom Heliogabalus had put in command of the Praetorians, and by recalling Paul to his homeland at the beginning of his reign, both being jurists. Although he ruled for not more than thirteen years, he left the state strengthened in all respects. It had grown through its struggles from Romulus to Septimius, and by then, because of the policies of Bastianus, it stood at its peak, so to speak. 
It was due to Alexander that it did not immediately collapse. Henceforth, as long as the emperors were more intent upon dominating their subjects than upon subjugating foreign peoples and preferred to fight amongst themselves, they threw the Roman state into steep decline, as it were, and men were put in power indiscriminately, good and bad, noble and base-born, even many of barbarian extraction. In fact, when there is universal confusion, and nothing is done in its proper manner, all think it right, as is natural amid chaos, to seize the offices of others which they cannot discharge, and they shamefully corrupt any conception of honorable conduct. So the violent power of fortune, once it has acquired unfettered freedom, drives on mortals with destructive desire. For a long time, indeed, it is restrained by virtue, as if by a wall. But after almost all were overcome by depravity, it entrusted even the government to the lowest in birth and training. Section 25 For, in fact, Gaius Julius Maximinus, the governor of Trebellica, Though he was practically illiterate, was the first common soldier to seize power as the choice of the legions. However, the senators also approved of this since they considered it dangerous for unarmed men to resist one backed by an army. His son, who had the same name, Gaius Julius Maximus, was made Caesar. Section 26. When they had held power for two years and had fought, not without success, against the Germans, suddenly Antinius Gordian, the proconsul of Africa, was made emperor by the army at the town of Thistrus, though he was not present. When he had been summoned and arrived there, as if he might be made emperor by just doing that, he was greeted with a mutiny. This he easily suppressed and made for Carthage. There, while he was performing the rites according to custom to avert prodigies, for he was not unreasonably troubled by the fear of these, suddenly the victim gave birth. The soothsayers, and he above all, for he was exceptionally skilled in the practice of this art, interpreted it to mean that he, in fact, was destined to die, but he would procure the imperial power for his children. Continuing further with their prophecy, they foretold the death of his child, too, predicting that he would be gentle and innocent, like the animal, but he would not live long or be subject to treachery. Meanwhile, at Rome, when Gordian's death had been reported, the urban prefect and the rest of the magistrates were murdered in public by the praetorian cohorts at the instigation of Domitius. Indeed, Gordian, after he had learned that the imperial power had been conferred upon him, had sent envoys and a letter to Rome promising substantial rewards. When he had been killed, the soldiers were angry at being deceived by these promises. Being the sort of men who are very greedy for money and loyal and true solely for profit, but the Senate, since there was no government and the city looked as if it might be occupied, was afraid that worse things would happen. So first it established a board with shared powers and subsequently conscripted the younger men and appointed Clodius Pupianos and Caecilius Balbinus as the Caesars. Section 27 During the same period in Africa, the soldiers appointed it as Augustus Gordian's son, Gordian, who happened to be on his father's staff, though he was a young boy and was subsequently Praetorian Prefect. And the nobility certainly did not reject this move. Finally, when he had been summoned, the Praetorian detachments were destroyed in combat among the hills of the city and its very center by bands of gladiators and an army of recruits. While this was taking place at Rome, the two Julii Maximini, who by chance were at that time occupied in Thrace, learned what had happened and hastily made for Italy. At the siege of Aquilia, Pupianos killed them after they had been defeated in battle and the remaining troops had gradually deserted. A year was added to their two-year reign through delays of this kind. Not long afterwards, Clodius and Caecilius were slain in the palace at Rome during a military revolt and Gordian became sole ruler. That very year, when he had extended and consolidated the quinquennial games which Nero had introduced to Rome, he set out against the Persians after he had first opened the doors of the temple of Janus, which Marcus had closed according to ancestral custom. There he conducted a brilliant campaign, but perished in the sixth year of his reign through the intrigues of his praetorian prefect, Marcus Philippus. And so Marcus Julius Philippus, an Arab from Thraconitis, took his son Philip as a partner, settled his affairs in the east, founded the town of Philippopolis in Arabia, and came to Rome with his son. They constructed a reservoir on the other side of the Tiber because that region used to be plagued by a shortage of water. And they celebrated the thousandth anniversary of the city with games of all kinds. And since the name has reminded me in time, too, the 1100th anniversary passed by in the consulship of a Philip. But it was celebrated with none of the customary festivities. 
So drastically has the concern for the city of Rome diminished day by day. In fact, they say that this was announced at that time by prodigies and portents, one of which I would like to mention briefly. For when some victims were being sacrificed according to pontifical law, female genitals appeared on a hog's abdomen. This the soothsayers interpreted to predict the decadence of later generations and the aggravation of vices. The Emperor Philip, because he thought that this would prove false, and then again because he had caught sight of a young boy prostitute resembling his son as he happened to walk past him, took very honorable measures to abolish the practice of male prostitution. Nevertheless, it still survives, for if circumstances are altered, it is practiced even more outrageously as long as men seek more avidly whatever is dangerous and forbidden. Furthermore, the Etruscan arts had predicted something quite different. Since they asserted that when good men, for the most part, lie helpless, the effeminate men would be happy. But I, for one, categorically believed that they were wrong. The fact is that however successfully everything turns out, who can still be happy if he has lost his sense of decency? Yet if that has been retained, everything else is bearable. After completing these projects, he left his son in the city and set out in person against Decius even though he was physically weak because of his age. He fell at Verona after his defeat and the loss of his army. When news of this had reached Rome, his son was killed in the Praetorian camp. They had enjoyed five years of power. End of section 28 and the end of part 3 of this reading. Remember that you can contact me on the podcast Facebook page or at the email address everythinghistorypodcast at gmail.com Thank you very much.